Hello, my friends. Welcome to The Greg Crino Show. My guest today was a law enforcement officer in Los Angeles County for over 30 years. She started in the 1970s when women were very new to the field and eventually earned the leadership position of commander. She kicked a lot of ass and took a lot of names along the way, and she's here to do the same to me today. Please welcome my good friend, Kathy Taylor. All right, Kathy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Greg. I appreciate (laughs) you having me. This is new for you. Very new for me. Thank you very much. I'm an old retired girl now. I know, and actually, it was funny. I was... um, we were talking mm-hmm. just a few minutes ago about a lot of things, and it seemed like in the beginning there was some hesitation about interviews and media and things like that. And I think it's actually a pretty good way to start this thing off because um, back when you entered, it was more contentious. It seemed like interviews were not as not as fun. Like what what like what were some of your experiences dealing with interviews in the past? In the past, and I think it important that we mention way, way, way in the past, because I hired on the Sheriff's Department, Los Angeles County, in 1974. So as far as... Before I was born. Way before (laughs) you were born, and you're such an old man now. So do the math, Greg. Do the math, right? Back when, um, interviews started very early on, and that's because as uh, women on the department, we weren't a rarity, yet there was a lack of familiarity with women on the department, what they did, how they were hired on, and um, the progression through history of the Sheriff's Department. So there was always in the beginning somewhat of a curiosity about uh, women on the department, But secondly, there always seemed to be some sort of an agenda that had to do with the fact that you were a girl and how is it that a girl could possibly do X, Y, and Z on the job. And I never, ever expected that to be such a sought-after uniqueness because I saw it as a job that I'd signed up to do because I wanted to do it. There was no uniqueness to it. It was a a whole different path for me in that regard. So yes, interviews in the beginning were usually with some sort of a specific agenda to the fact that I was a girl and I was doing this man's world job and why? Right, right. So did you find that people would seek you out, so media people would seek you out for, to, I, I guess, to push their agenda because you were you were new. Obviously, you were obviously a woman. You're in a leadership position. Um, were they trying to, you find they were trying to push their agenda and that bugged you and you're like, hey, I wanted to talk about police activity. I want to talk about policy. I want to talk about the job. And they would kind of push it in a different direction, and that would that that was irritating. Well, I w- I'll hearken you back to uh, way back when, 1974, when I hired on and graduated from the Sheriff's Academy mm-hmm. after a six-month training program in the Sheriff's Academy. It was 1975 because I hired on in November of 74, so I graduated in 1975. What month in 1975, might I ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was going to be April. Okay, so you were you you were a sheriff before I was I was born in July. No, I, I take that back, <laughs> June, because it was six months. So I have to do that okay. math. So yeah, I was yeah. Uh, re- forty-five years ago, almost to the date. Almost to the date. Wow. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I jumped in your story there. No, it's but, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, where it, this all started was in the sheriff's academy. Uh, there was a big push for women hiring on the department at the time because at the specific time that I hired on, the Sheriff's Department had decided to consider sending women to different jobs other than custody, and that meant going to patrol. So there was a dynamic that was taking place at the moment I hired on. Realizing that the department was going to need more women they started hiring more women so that they could eventually open up the floodgates to send women to patrol. Now, they weren't certain how many women they were going to send to patrol, per se, but they just knew that there was a reason for them to move forward in that regard back as far as 1974. When they opened the floodgates 
and more women were hired on all at once, I was in that package. There were 25 of us that were on, in my academy class, which was unheard of back then. Normally, there were about five or six, maybe 10 women at a time. Those women only trained for a short period of time and then went straight to custody. When I hired on, we went for the entire six-month academy. And upon graduation, yes, like the men, we went to custody. But there was a difference because we had also had to prove ourselves physically in the academy. We had to do everything that the men did. That wasn't necessarily the case prior to that. So we took, uh, we did all, the, all of the physical activities, all of the running exercises, all the strengthening exercises, and that with the men each and every day. We also had to test the same test as the men and pass the same test as the men except for one thing, and that was we, as women, did a different pull-up. And it wasn't the same pull-up as a man. The flexed arm hanger. That's was the, correct. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so when I graduated from the academy, my first interview I did upon graduation day was because um, I had been recognized for my physical ability in the academy and having passed every one of the physical training tests with a perfect score of 500. Wow. Uh, there weren't any other women that did that in my class. There were plenty of other men that did that in my class. And the reason that I make a point of all of this is that I still, too, did not pass that test like the male had to with a male pull-up. I was permitted to do a female pull-up instead. Yet, it was a big enough hoop de doo at the time, that that was my very first interview as a deputy sheriff mm -hmm. on the job by the news media, and that's where my career interviewing began. They really weren't interested at that point in time in much other than why is it that a girl would want to do a job like this? So it seemed like you were... Okay, so... The type of people who are interviewing you, they could come from all different agendas, it seems like. Like some of them would maybe challenge you because you were a woman. Others would say, well, we want more women on the force, and so we're going to look for things to you know, get more women. I, I don't know. I mean, it seems like they could come from a liberal or conservative perspective. I, I mean, it seemed back then... Back I'm sure then, you did deal with a lot of people challenging why you were there. Like, you, why would why would a woman want to be a cop? Which actually, we can talk about. Why did you want to be a cop? <laughs> well, let me answer your first question. Sure. I believe that back then it was just a matter of curiosity. Okay. Yeah, people were curious. What yeah. the heck would you want to do this kind of you job? You thought it was an for? exciting job. You're getting out there and you're catching bad guys and you're uh, you're physical. You're out outside. I mean. Secondly, it was a, a, a petite woman. Mm -hmm. You know, why would a petite woman think in the first place that they could do a job like this? But then aside from all of that, what I found important to parlay to many back then, and I still do, is the fact that I was there because I wanted to be. My desire had grown each and every day through going through the Sheriff's Academy and by God, if I was going to do this job, I was going to do it well, and I was going to represent the department well, because I developed a deep sense of pride in the department, the way that they acted, how they worked, and the types of personalities that I saw that I really gravitated to. Uh, strength in character, strength in judgment, strength in a sense of fair play. Uh, all of those things in a girl or a guy are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So what I found in the job in the beginning was, my goodness, it makes no difference as long as you decide in your soul that you are ready to line up and play just like the next guy. Mm -hmm. So I will hearken you from that to where this all got started. And I think it a fun, interesting conversation, mainly because I never had law enforcement intentions in my career goals whatsoever. 
I'd never even thought about it before. It's going to take a couple of minutes to share this with you, but it is a fun story. I absolutely have time. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Uh, my husband and I were married when I was 18 and he was 19. Some would call that young. We didn't necessarily look at it like that because it seemed as if from the very beginning we had a deep sense of desire um, to share as a husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend at that time and then to be husband and wife. And we also knew way back when that whatever it was that we were going to do, we were going to make it. We weren't sure how, why, or when, but we were going to make it. And we started our lives together with that very simple twinkle in our eye, we were going to make it. It was after my husband graduated from college, and we were very poor. He opened up the newspaper and looked at an ad, a full-page ad, I might add, at the time, from the sheriff's department. Come on down, apply, take the test. Wouldn't you like to be a deputy sheriff? My husband looked at me and said, do you know what a deputy sheriff does? <laughs> and I scratched my head. I looked back at him and I go, well, I know that they're policemen. I couldn't tell you <laughs> hiding their hair what they do. But he said to me at the time, Kathy, with my college degree, I can make $999 a month because I have a BA, and not only that, they have health insurance. Wow. That's all it took for us. Yeah, so it became more, it sounded like uh, it was a, relation, a desire to keep the relationship as a team, and then you just thought it was something exciting and interesting, and you would do that together. And Shortly thereafter, went. he was hired. Yeah. Um, and it was a great, great thing for us because we were, as I said, very poor. Getting through school and just making it through school was the first step. When he started the academy, it wasn't until two years after he graduated from the academy, was working in the jails, that he came to me because I was still in school then full time because I could. He says to me, I know you're in school. I know you want to be a PE teacher. I know that that sounds like a really great idea to you, but I am here to tell you, Kathy Taylor, <laughs> you're cut out for this job of police work. I can see it written all over your personality, all over your face, all over your desires. I really think you should check it out and see for yourself what I'm talking about. I'd never thought twice about it. That was his job. It wasn't mine. So I did. I started taking ride-alongs. I started watching the way uh, male police officers work, not with the sheriff's department, but with cities. I took tours of the jail. I talked to people. This is all through through your husband. Through He's my able to husband. He's get you into the, the jail and get, get, get you visits and things like that. Through him making okay. the suggestions. He didn't set anything up for me. I did it myself. Okay. And it was at that point... I looked at what was happening and what the possibilities were and the fact that there was this ability to participate not only as a good person, but as physically I could participate. It excited me. And I said, you know what? I think you're right, Jim Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> this is for me. And so I uh, made the application, and it was six months later that I was hired. And that's when I learned that the sheriff's department was looking for a lot more women, and it was going to happen very quickly. Okay, so some of that was, was just timing, but what got you in there was, was your husband. Bottom line. Wow. He's the one that suggested it and is the one that uh, saw something in me that I did not see, and I appreciate that to this day. Now, yeah. you fast forward, that's 51 years ago, and we're... Not yeah. exactly 51 years, but we've been married for 51 years. Yeah. And uh, we still have each other's back. Yeah. How's it, was it um, challenging at times um, relationship-wise? I mean, were, the schedule, the, were there conflicts at work that made that challenging? I mean, I, I imagine it probably was. I don't, I don't know. Or 
it's an outstanding question, and it's because it becomes part of your life yeah. once you start this job, because it is quite demanding. And uh, that whole question can segue into, in my opinion, the fact that I hired on the job with two sons already. One was five and one was three when I joined the sheriff's department. Oh, they were? Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah doing the math. Yeah, that's true. Okay. We'd already had babies. Yeah. And oh, it my was God. You were a young family. Young. Two small kids. Energetic. Jumping in to be a, a cop on the streets of Los Angeles in the mid-1970s. Yes. When I'm, crime back then was pretty high. I mean, it was not a, an easy time. I mean, we had the, the riots of the late 60s, and then our 70s was just kind of a doldrums of the economy. I mean, what... So did you go right to patrol, or how did how quickly did you... So you graduated the academy in six months, and then did you go right to... What was your first job? I did not go right to patrol, and to make it clear, uh, no one goes straight to patrol from the okay. sheriff's academy. And the reason is, is that a lot of people don't realize the sheriff's department is responsible by state mandate of two things. Actually, three. One is, is that they are responsible for custody, maintaining custody of prisoners. City police departments can only house a prisoner for three days, and then they have to be transferred to custody um, facilities. Secondly, uh, we are in charge of any unincorporated area for patrol. And then lastly, the mandate says that we will maintain the court system. So the Sheriff's Department automatically has three jobs that expand into way other far deep um, roles in the world of police work. But if everything were to harken back to three specific things that we are required to do, those are the three. Okay, so it, it said it's prison, uh, custody, unincorporated. Patrolling of unincorporated yeah. areas, and then courts. Okay. We are responsible for maintaining all of the uh, decorum in a court. Okay, so I didn't know that. Now, I now disclosure here, my dad was uh, in the L.A. County Deputy Sheriff's as well. Now, you know that. Um, Proudly, you, I know the that. <laughs> the audience now knows that. And it was great to serve with him. Yeah, yeah, he, he loved it with you as well. I mean, but he was in the, he did both. He did patrol and he did, he did, um, he worked in the, the courts and the, the jails as well. But I didn't realize that so much of the responsibility of the Sheriff's Department was outside of just standard patrol. That's correct. Okay. That, and if you take a look at it, people will then ask, well, how come I see people in Bellflower, and how come I see people in Lakewood, and how come I see people out in Santa Clarita? Those are not unincorporated areas. When a city incorporates, they have the responsibility to determine whether or not they are going to incorporate and create their own de police department, much like Long Beach Police Department, Long Beach decided to have their own PD. Or a city can decide to contract with the Sheriff's Department. Therefore, the reason that you see people in these particular cities that aren't unincorporated, the reason that the Sheriff is patrolling those areas is because they, in fact, have that city has hired the Sheriff's Department to do the job for them. Okay, so they contracted out. That's interesting because in Santa Monica, where, where I live, they have their own police department. Mm -hmm. Venice, well, Venice Beach is part of Los Angeles, but they, they, they don't. They're, they're patrolled by LAPD, sort of. There's not a whole lot of patrolling that goes on in Venice. But, but yeah, it is, that is a dynamic that I think most people don't, don't realize. Is there any... Um, so, well, back to your career. So how can you go through the progression of... of of your career? Because you ended up as a lieutenant. Am I correct on that one? No, I retired as a commander. Commander. Okay. So what are the... it starts deputy sheriff, promotion to sergeant, promotion to lieutenant, promotion to captain, and then promotion to commander. Oh, I, under, I underranked you. I'm very sorry about well, that. Well, you know what? <laughs> it's okay. I'm going to have to I cut you off right at the ranks. knees, right? <laughs> that's, that's why we have yeah. you here. Like, and yeah. then above okay. myself were chiefs, Assistant sheriffs, the under sheriff, and then the sheriff. So okay. I had four ranks above me, and one of them being elected, which is the sheriff. Wow, okay. What were some of the, the political machinations within the department? Well, let me hearken you back first and foremost uh, so we don't uh, lose track of 
how I went to custody first. Everybody, okay. when they graduate from the academy, goes straight to custody. Okay. It's kind of like playing the game of Monopoly. You know, you go straight to jail, don't pass go. Okay. You graduate from that academy and boom, right, right the there jail. you go. You're yeah. right in the jail. <laughs> and there is then a list that is created for one to go to patrol. You pick the stations that you would like to go to. You're given a choice of three. And you wait on a list until your name comes up. When your name comes up, then it's your turn to go to one of those stations that you have asked to go to. And you transfer out to patrol from custody, and you begin a six-month training program in patrol. Then you get off training if you are worthy enough of it and have accomplished what all of the stepping stones are for that to happen. And then you work a radio car at a station. Once you have decided that you've had enough of work in a radio car, some people stay there forever, others want to move on, then you apply for jobs elsewhere throughout the department. Each and every step of your taking another step into a career path on the department has to happen by application. You go interview. You produce all of your past work stuff that you brought with you, and you were either picked for the job or you're not. Okay. So there's a lot of um, interviewing along the way. There's a lot of proving yourself along the way. And there's a lot of the desire that comes with that to move on because you don't have to if you don't want to. You can stay in patrol forever. You can stay in custody. Uh, now, I don't even want to go there so let's stay off of that one. When I hired on the department, you went to custody. Usually it took about two and a half years to get out of custody, and okay. then you'd go to patrol. And it, the expectation was is that you would spend two and a half, three, four years in patrol. And you, Well, you did six months of training before going to patrol. So you do your academy, then custody, then a couple of years, and then six months of training, and then patrol. Did I get that right? Once you get out of custody and go straight to a patrol station, you are in a radio car with a training officer. And you do about six months of training with a training officer. Oh, so it's sort of on the job. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, okay. and once you get out of off of training, then you're in a radio car by yourself. Okay. So that's the progression. And that is where uh, we as a couple, my husband and I, I'll hearken you back to that question, raising boys and having them three and five at the time when I got out of the academy and started right on uh, 11 at night till seven in the morning shifts. Oh. There, it's not like jails are only Monday through Friday, nine to five. I mean, you guys just can't just set up a close up shop like the DMV and then everything's just fine, huh? Exactly. Oh, yeah, you got to put them to bed and watch them sleep. And C crime, crime just doesn't wait. That's <laughs> Crime's it. Crime's only not, not from just from nine to five. Well, okay. here's where the silver lining came in, because uh, we realized very quickly as a couple that if we were going to remain a couple and if we were going to enjoy family life, that we were going to have to find a way to fit the work schedule in and still maintain that couple family life rendezvous with life, because everything is not work. My biggest enjoyment out of work and home was to find a balance. Now, it may seem skewed to you because it certainly was ass backwards to me, mm -hmm. but what we did is we hired a babysitter that stayed with the boys 11 o'clock at night till 7 o'clock in the morning. Being as young as they were, they were in bed before we left, and they weren't quite up yet when we got home. And so they never thought we worked. Now, of course, what suffered was sleep. I was going to say, like, how do you... We'd get yeah. six hours of sleep in, max, because that live-in sitter was with us. Um, I need to back up. Not in the very beginning. What we did is our oldest five went to school. The youngest one, we put in daycare for the four hours, four and a half hours that our son was in school. And then we would go pick them up and bring them home. And we would catch sleep as we could. It was uh, six hours, maybe, I got every day. Ouch. Oftentimes, we'd try and go back down to sleep. Once we put the boys down to bed, kind of getting a couple-hour nap before we got up and went to work. And then what we did, too, is we picked days off during the week. 
please give me Tuesday, Wednesdays off, we used to ask. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody wants a weekend, of course. Well, we didn't care as long as we had the days off together. So we tried to create a family uh, style that gave us the best of both worlds. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. <laughs> yeah, I so said it's got to be challenging. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's, that's amazing. I can't imagine trying to keep that, that schedule together with, with little ones. I mean, that's amazing. And thereafter, yeah. what we learned is that we needed to hire a live-in sitter that where we had a little more flexibility in the event that when we were both working patrol, um, because my husband and I worked different stations, usually getting the, what we called the early morning shift, 11 at night till 7 in the morning, 10 at night till 6 in the morning, that uh, we were able to still keep that sleep at night for the boys, were gone for the bo with with the boys being watched by a sitter. And then we would be up until they went to school and then get up before they got home. What, um, so if you're just switching gears a little bit, so if you're on, on patrol, how did you, how did you like that? I mean, that seems to be, that I mean, seems to be the most dangerous slash sexy part of being a cop. I mean, is that how it's viewed in the department? Like is patrol the place to be? Was it, did you find it exciting? Um, what, what did you think about the whole process? What was your least favorite part about it or your most favorite part? Patrol is definitely a, uh, a nature of its own beast. Yeah. It's a blast. Because that's what the public sees. I and mean, we, we see the patrol. We don't see the back shop and all the administrative things. Mm -hmm. And you rarely see big news stories about something that happened in a court. You know, you, you'll see what happens on patrol. Like, that's the It's the most visible. Yeah. And definitely the most volatile and definitely the most fun. <laughs> uh, what I can hearken you to with this wonderful structure that we had is that having spent two and a half years in custody, you get to see all the bad guys in a controlled environment. You watch how they manipulate in a controlled environment. You watch their personalities and idiosyncrasies. You watch them kick drugs. You watch them um, be sneaky. You watch them lie. You watch them cheat. And you watch some that don't belong there. You know, you get the gambit, let's face mm -hmm. it. When you have that opportunity to grow internally and personally in your ability to talk with people that didn't necessarily get raised like you got raised, and it's a, a huge revelation that not everybody got mom and dad in a house and dad worked and mom didn't and oh, yeah, you definitely. didn't have any money. And yeah, you never <laughs> see it. It's a very stark... Yeah. reality when you go to prison and you see what yeah. or just jail and you see what people have had to deal with in their lives yeah and you kind of understand how you got there definitely <laughs> but then what you do is you already have that little bit of a tool in your tool belt and that experience that opens your eyes and makes you more creative thinking on your feet it gives you great judgment about people it educates you to character and how important that is, telling the truth, uh, treating people with respect. I don't care who they are. Nobody ever should be deprived of their respect. And there are certain levels of that. And sometimes when you are thinking about the fact that the bottom line is making a conscious decision to take somebody to jail and remove their freedoms from them, it's a very, very powerful thing. And if you are able to do it by continuing to garner respect from whomever that is, as minimal as that might be in their world, it's something. You're saying when you give them respect, it, it, it changes their behavior and, and you can get things done more effectively. You earn it in return. Yeah. I think, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I've, I've talked to other um, officers as well and they'll tell you that we don't have as much power as you might think in terms of getting people to behave a certain way. And he says that you can, for a short period of time, be a total jerk. He's like, but there's a lot of people out there and you're identified, you're wearing a uniform and word gets out about who's, 
who's not behaving on the law enforcement side. And it, so there is, in an odd way, a sort of justice is not just one direction, I guess. It's, so, respect is mutual. Re, yeah, respect goes a long way. Well, my dad would say that. He would say when he would, he would go into the, the jail, it was just him with 20 or 30 inmates. He's like, any one of those guys could have jumped me and beat me and killed me. But they never did because I, I treated everybody with respect and, and, and they always liked me. Mm -hmm. So It's true. Yeah. It's true. It's uh, being able to think on your feet as well. Yes, uh, respect is an amazing thing and it works both ways. What I can tell you too is uh, as far as the moving on to patrol, that was a conscious decision that I made. I did not have to at the time. But again, we were right on that cusp of women going to patrol completely. You either, if you had to go to patrol, but there was a time when that decision was made. I was well before that decision. And so my choice to go to patrol was because I wanted to. I wanted to get out to the streets. I wanted to work that job. So I, I'm, I'm a little confused. I thought they would not allow women into patrol until a certain year. Uh, they were disallowed from that, then they changed that law. Am I missing something? No, you're uh, not missing okay. anything. You're not, um, let me clarify it for okay. you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just prior to me coming on the department, women never went to patrol. Were they not allowed to or? They were not allowed. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, they, all, they were able to move around the department and uh, seek out different clerical, secretarial, uh, uh, um, and I like shouldn't say that kind of administrative or, right, type okay. of jobs. Um, there were some in detective bureau. So there were some limited positions that they could go work. For the most part, they worked custody. At the time that I came on, the idea was beginning to formulate that they were going to send women to patrol. But when I finally went to patrol, women still did not have to go if they didn't want to. They could still continue to work the jail for as long as they wanted, except that the things that came with working patrol opened up other avenues and doors job-wise right. that were no longer allowed to the women that decided to stay in custody. Right. So you okay. either went to patrol to go these other avenues or you stayed in custody. So your career is just limited unless you had a, a patrol experience. Correct. And that, that was always the rub. I, well, I saw the same thing in the, the military. I didn't yeah. see it. It was before I, I arrived. But women couldn't be fighter pilots or they couldn't go to combat. Right. And so, yes, they were allowed in the military. They were allowed to fly fighter aircraft, but they couldn't go to combat. And so if you had no combat experience, then, of course, you wouldn't get promoted. And then, and then of course, all that had to... It was the exactly the same thing. There okay. was a promotion process for the ladies at that time, yet uh, it was a rule that finally got established on the department, and it was known as the 214 rule, and it had to do with Class 214. After Class 214, you had to go to patrol. Okay. They, they finally made a delineating line. I was way prior to class 214. Okay, so you and went because so you were a badass. I, I wanted to go. <laughs> there were I some wanted. women that were probably to told to go, but of course they knew that when they signed on to the sheriff's department. Mm -hmm. So in a way, people but knew what they were getting into. It's an interesting story because I yeah. never expected to go to patrol as fast as I did. Why did I get to go so fast? Because back then, there were two lists for patrol. The girl list and the boy list. And the decision was made if there was a woman at a patrol station that wanted to leave or go elsewhere or quit the department. That woman had to be replaced with another woman. They were keeping girl for girl back then, okay. if, if you will. So all of a sudden, one day, I get this call. Hey, Taylor. You want to go to Lakewood Station and go to patrol like tomorrow? And I thought, you got to be kidding me. Well, come to find out, the lady that was at the station that wanted to leave was pregnant. And she was um, moving on. She was getting out of police work. And so with a snap of a finger, 
I'm next up on the list. Now, why was I next up on the list? I shouldn't have been, but the two women ahead of me that were waiting to go to Lakewood Station were both pregnant, and they wouldn't take them. Okay. I happen to be the young mom with boys yeah, already not already, having any more like babies. I've, I've been through all that. And here we are. <laughs> here we are. So off to patrol I went yeah. probably a year sooner than I should have. Okay. Um, did, you, did you find any pushback either way? Like people that were, what was the, how many people were supportive of you being there? How many people were, give you crap? Like what was your overall experience? Well, here's the good news. There were, I'm counting one, two. There were about five women that worked Lakewood Station at the time that I arrived. Out of, out of how many total people that worked there? Oh, 230. Oh, wow. That's a small percentage. Small percentage. Yeah. yeah they were there. Some of them were older women uh, that had been on the department for quite some time and were, were working detective jobs. They were one of those that moved into a position that they were allowed to move into, uh, not having work patrol. Some of them were women that had chosen to go to patrol as the first patrol class ever for women. And then there were those that had already come out to a station, gone through the training program, and were deputy sheriffs working the field or the desk. So I had five or six... I can't remember how many at the time that uh, I could observe, and um, they helped mentor me. Some did, some didn't, like any place else. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's how I uh, started out at Lakewood Station. Okay, and then um, just I would like to talk about the funny story with the bathrooms, if we could go into that, because... I know there are many obstacles, but then there are some obstacles that you would not normally think of. Um, and one was the, the, the bathroom issue. So can you kind of just chat about that? Because I, I do think it's funny. Yeah. Because there are some parallels that I see um, in the military that I, I normally would not think about. Like as a guy, I'm like, okay, well, you're here. We're going through the training. This is fine. You know, as long as you can pass. Like, hey, what are we complaining about? What, you know, but could you go into the... Yeah, like, bathroom. where am I going to pee? That's a big one. <laughs> you know, in more ways than one, too. Like, for, the, for as a guy, you know, the whole world is a bathroom. That's it's it. It's just not something we worry about. That's it. It's so darn funny because working a patrol, especially, I developed one hell of a good bladder. <laughs> I could go for hours without having to pee. Yeah. And it's we make light of it, but it's true. I mean, yeah. where do you pee? For a girl, I had to find a place like a um, hospital emergency room. So this is a, while you're on patrol, you while you're on have patrol. places that you knew that you could you could... You can yeah. go. <laughs> because once you leave the station, you just don't get to come back anytime you want. Yeah. You're given a patrolled area to, to patrol. Yeah. And you're expected to be in that patrol area. You're not supposed to be expected to be meandering back to the station every now and then to take a whiz. So, <laughs> so I found places in patrol that okay. were most definitely uh, secure enough for me to be able to go in and drop my gun belt and drop my everything to yeah, go just, to the bathroom. You can't just exactly. let, it, let it rip like a guy would. Exactly. You know, yeah, it, so it was pretty funny. Uh, fire stations were another one. Okay. But that was funny in and of itself because I would pull up and they'd look at me and they'd go, you know, you're not here to see us. We know that. You're not here to just uh, shoot the bull and, and uh, you know, throw us a kiss, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> we know you're here to pee. I go, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so true. they were. Uh, we always made light of it. Uh, the one bathroom story. If we're going to fast forward through things, that always uh, sticks out of my mind the biggest is way down the road. I'd been from deputy to sergeant, promoted to lieutenant, and was selected. Um, to become part of our Sheriff's Special Enforcement Bureau team, which is SWAT. And I'd been on the department for quite a few years. 
that all is a whole nother story. But in that, the day that I showed up at the bureau, as they call it, or SEB, the only bathroom that they had was a public restroom for women who came temporarily to the facility, but no place for a woman to shower or uh, store their gear or go to the bathroom. And so I had to set out on my own in the facility to figure out where I was going to shower. You know, and the guys are, of course, with their arms crossed watching this going on because they know what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to even put my <laughs> darn gear. And so uh, what ended up happening is walking into a training office. Off the back of the training office was this door that I stepped into, and I went, well, hallelujah. There's a shower, and there's a toilet. It was a urinal, I might add, but it was at least a it's toilet. Some, it's something. It's something. <laughs> and there was a standing sink. It was mildewed. It was a rusty floor. And I said to myself, okay, self, if you're going to make this work, this is your bathroom. So what are you going to do to make that happen? Yeah, I, I think it's... Um I think it's funny because um, as, a, as a pilot, female pilots go through the same thing. Yes. And we have, to, we have to pee in the airplane. There's no, well, in a fighter aircraft, there's no bathroom for anybody. But as a guy, we can pee in these bags. And women have to use a special cup holder, and it, it becomes a problem. And what was happening is it was such a, an issue. And also, the flight suits were not made for women. They didn't zip down far enough, so they couldn't, they couldn't go. And so, what, unfortunately, what a lot of them would do is dehydrate which became a big problem because when you're on a, a you know, eight, 10 hour mission and you're starting to get headaches and not thinking clearly and it's like, well, why? Well, because I can't drink water. We can't drink water because I don't want to pee. I can't pee because I don't have the right flight suit. It's like, oh my God, we have to, we have to get some equipment here. And it's just not something that most of us would, would think about. So I think it's just kind of funny how you dealt with that. It <laughs> is just amazing how sometimes the simplest things just put this big smile on my face when you harken back to it. Yeah, you know, come gotta, on, let's face it. want to be able to use the bathroom. What I know. called it was cameling up. What do you mean by cameling I up? I want to know what you mean by cameling well, up. Well, how long can a camel go across the Sahara Desert with a couple of humps and all that water stored up in there, right? Yeah. I had to camel up, only it was in the opposite. I couldn't drink water. I yeah. mean, you know, it was one of those things where you just had to figure out at what point in time you were going to be able to camel up and store some liquid in you, knowing that you would have a bathroom at some point in time yeah. to pee in. Yeah. Oh, it's funny how, how much this parallels the pilot lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's when you're stuck in a tiny cockpit with nowhere to go. And peeing is not, peeing is easier, but... Obviously, there are other things you got to worry about, too, so it's, it's funny. So the end of that bathroom story is, is that I discovered from the guy in the training office that this restroom was what the inmates used. We had trustees that washed the radio cars, and they um, do various jobs around the, uh, the facility, and that was their bathroom. And so I asked of the training guy, how often it was used by the trustees, and the answer was, we don't have them anymore, and I swooped on it. But what I did was, and this, this lends credence to the kind of good character, judgment, uh, fun personality people that I worked with, I asked of them, would you mind if I just took a poll and put it across this, and when the Sheet is closed. I'm going to draw on the sheet, you know, keep the sheet shut, you <laughs> rat bastards, yeah. you know, something <laughs> like that. And um, I need to use this as my place to shower. God love them. Yeah. I had just, I had just walked through that back door. And that gesture alone delivered to them that I was there to line up and play, that I was not there to be some little prissy nail-filing individual getting a ticket punched, and that I truly needed a place to put my gear and shower and pee. The next day when I arrived at work, fully expecting to take my sheet that I'd drawn, you know, when it's closed, don't come in, they'd put a door up. 
The guys at the bureau put a door up for me. Now, the side note to that is, is that directly to the left of that door jam was a very, very, very tiny little hole that they had drilled through the entire wall and very, very nicely printed fiber optics here. Now, what does that mean? Yeah. In the world of SWAT, you have ways of um, observing things by sticking a camera underneath a door, okay. seeing what's there. Well, it was fiber optics at the time. That was what we called it. And so they were making a joke of the fact that they'd put a door up, but they were still going to be able to put this fiber optic through Ooh. and scope in on. So it was a standing joke. I mean, yeah. they didn't mean to do it, but it was yeah. just one of those funny yeah. things that the guys did that I did not ever, ever take as anything but you have arrived, we're honoring you with a door. Now, can we just move forward and have some fun? Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like once you're on the team, you're on the team. Like, nobody, nobody cares. And I think that's the, that seems like the overall lesson is when you go into it with respect, you do the best you can, that eventually you're going mm -hmm. to become part of the team. And so then, 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 uh, then the differences start to drip away at that point. Well, I'll hearken you back to something that I think um, takes this way fuller swing than you might even think. And that is, how is it that this all seemed to fall in my lap and I loved it so much? I thought about that because it's odd. You know, well, where did this come from? How come you're not playing with your dolls and stuff? Well, growing up, I never had a doll. I didn't like dolls. I like stuffed animals, but dolls didn't appeal to me. I needed to be outside. I needed to be playing, jumping, running, hopping, whatever it was, and luck be it, I ended up landing on a block of all boys. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to mix it up in that sandbox way back when with boys. Now, I wasn't the fastest, the strongest, sometimes the smartest, but always, and never the quickest. But I always figured out a way to personally be able to get on that team and play. I was never picked first, but I was picked, and I played. And I learned to talk some darn good smack. <laughs> It goes a long way. When you talk smack, the ice breaks. You're, it's just, it's a lot better. It is so much, and it's so yeah. much fun. Yeah. Well, it's I think, so much fun. I think sometimes there's, um, and I'm and I, I'm not surprised of what you're saying, to be honest, because I've, I've, like I said, in the fighter pilot world, women are about the same percentage, maybe, maybe less than 10% for sure. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, it was, it was just like you. It was like most of the women wanted to be outside. They were, I guess, tomboys, if you will. Tomboys. I was a total tomboy. For lack of a better word. Um, but they were just like you. They, they just wanted to be fighter pilots. They just wanted to go out and do the job. And people who, and, and we would do the jokes with them about, you know, like the bathroom joke that you had. They wouldn't care. They wouldn't take, and they would do it right back at us, and it was totally fine. And so I think once you have that understanding, then um, the male-female dynamic, it, it almost like it's not even a dynamic anymore. Um, not to say that there weren't some, some incidents every now and then, but it was pretty, pretty rare. So, Yeah, we all have those moments. Guys and girls have those moments where there is somebody that just doesn't get it, and they are this, the oddest personality person that really puts a thorn, not just in a girl's side or a guy's side, but everybody's side. Yeah. And you have to deal with that. So can you get an example about that one? Or I mean, if you want to, we don't have to, but... One in particular was, um, he, and he was in a position of supervisor mm. over, and it was in patrol. I'm not going to tell you where or at what rank or what. But this guy just simply did not have the ability to go past his pompous self. And that pompous self got him in a whole lot of trouble. So he did get in trouble. That's good. Yeah, he got in trouble. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it took a while. It took documentation. It took a coalition 
of everyone suddenly realizing that it just wasn't you. There was a whole lot of people this guy was infringing on. And, uh, guys and girls. Guys and girls. Okay, yeah, so you're just he an was asshole. non-discriminant in yeah. any way, shape, or form. Uh, it was always very cutting to the girls. We had our ways of dealing with them. Mm -hmm. uh, yet we documented. Yeah. Said this is it. You know, this guy doesn't get it. He's got he's got some great players here, and he's pissing them off. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So therefore, uh, we took the steps. A yeah. lot of us, not just girls. But yeah. a lot of us, and the guy, the guy was dealt with. What? what you, how about dealing with criminals in the street? How, how was that? Both as a cop, and did they treat you differently at all, or was it? Did you find that it was pretty much a minimal thing, or was there anything of note? Well, for a long while, it was um, again two things. I always, always knew that if I was going to represent the sheriff's department well and represent it in a way of um, respect, I needed to make sure that I was as physically fit as I could possibly be all the time. The first thing that I recognized when working patrol in the beginning was that when you encountered somebody on the streets, there would be this mind switching going on. And it actually worked in our favor because they're going, wait a minute, girl guy, girl guy, girl guy, holy smokes. I've never seen a woman in patrol before. And so then they start zoning in on you, but they don't want to go talk to you. They want to go talk to the guy because they're used to talking to guys. So it became a game a lot. But so why would they not want to talk to the girl or I guess novelty. they're just not used to it novelty okay it was just yeah, different it was novelty they, they they must not know what they're doing kind of oh. kind of thing the guys know what they're doing because they're used to that you okay. know they know how to deal with that but a girl was different and so there was a novelty to it uh, I did know that, oh, though that if I showed up with some big bubble butt and uh, you know stains on the front of my shirt it's not the same as a guy, and I needed to be ready for everybody to understand that uh, I could take care of myself. And I felt as if physical training and being physically fit and looking good in uniform was as important as how I dealt with people. Yeah. And then once they started to talk with you, and whether it be you ask good questions, you make light of something, uh, you, your personality is different, it's not so formal, the barriers begin to break down. But what I also knew is that my physical ability could never be equal to or above that of most all the males that I worked with. And so I had to make sure that in my world on the streets, that I maybe positioned myself differently, looked for a sense of advantage and leverage. Leverage was my friend. Yeah. Any kind of leverage. Can you explain leverage? Like, like actually physically handling somebody? Yeah. And yes. Uh, wherever the hair goes, the head goes. Okay. okay. Hair is a good one. Uh -huh. Wherever the hair goes, the head goes. Anything from the back of the neck pulls somebody off balance. Taking somebody out at the knees yeah. is another one. And, uh, of course, the vulnerable parts of someone's body, whether it be a male or female, um, are as important as well, unfortunately, if it got down to that. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah you if it got do, down to do. that, you go there. What do you think about, um, I'll connect this a little bit to today, about the concern about chokeholds. Um, you're hearing uh, laws or politicians that want to ban certain actions like the chokehold. And I, I don't have any law enforcement experience. I have a tiny bit of jujitsu experience. And I, I feel like a chokehold is pretty valuable at times. Like how, how would that, how, how would you deal with when they would remove tools from, from law enforcement? How would you compensate? What, what would you do differently? Or was that even an issue back then? Every part of any sort of a restraint or takedown drill that a sheriff's department or police department teaches is all based on past experience, what works, um, and what is um, 
valuable in the categories of escalation of force. Not any given move or technique is the first and foremost go-to. There are incremental steps that you learn and take according to the incident in which you are involved in. There were times when some sort of a hold around someone's neck for one reason or another, whether it was just happened or it was done with purpose. And I say just happened because when you're in a brawl, um, you, there, know, you can't be like going through the checklist. It's, it's very, very difficult to say, oh gosh, no, I can't let my arm do that right now. I have to go over here and do this. It, it's very, very difficult because it is quick and it's split. And you are in a different zone at that point in time. I'm not skirting the issue of chokehold. I am just uh, sharing with you that way back when to now, use of force policies and issues have guided and changed things all along. It changed from the minute that I stepped into the Sheriff's Department to the minute that I left, almost on a yearly basis. It's from, that often that they would be changing or modifying All the time the there's policies. evaluation wow. and self-check and state mandates, I might add. A okay. lot of this just is not developed by the department. It is regulated by the state, and you teach and train according to what the state mandates. And so it's not like we willy-nilly pull these things out of a hat and go, oh, this sounds like a great idea to mess with somebody physically. No. They are taught because it has been a learned process that oftentimes works based on circumstances and some are sometimes dire. I remember one time in particular, and it's almost the only thing that worked, and that was to get uh, a guy off of my partner. Uh, he, my partner had an afro. And at, back then in the 70s, no, you know, yeah. hey, 80s, <laughs> man, we're talking mod squad here. Yeah. He had one very nice afro, and yeah. this guy had his hands embedded into my partner's head and was smashing his head against the ground. Wow. So if you think for a hot second that I am going to say, gee, let me think about that, that training. <laughs> I don't know if I can use that chokehold right here and now. Yeah. Well, I didn't smash the guy over the head with a flashlight, but I certainly did get my arm underneath him and oh, around yeah. his neck yeah. and managed to get some sort of a grip on him to get him off my partner. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I just think it's completely unrealistic to be mandating certain, especially like in hand to hand combat. I, I mean, you have to have use of force rules, but man, in, a, in an actual fist fight or a brawl, like, I don't, I just don't know how that's possible. And, and like I said, with the, the little jujitsu training I, I've had, like, I feel like with chokeholds, you can teach those in a, in a, appropriate manner. I mean, the key is not really the chokehold. The key is when you let go. <laughs> there you go. Once the guy's yeah. unconscious, okay, then you can let go. And what? they'll be just fine. I've almost been choked out myself. And it's, you know, you come back to in about 30 seconds and hopefully at that point you have handcuffs on you and yeah. it's over. Well, it's um, things, if we fast forward, are constantly evolving. It is nothing new that... All of these processes take something to cause change. I am never, ever one to think that change is not a good idea. I, I myself was a product of change, and I appreciate it and embrace yeah, it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, yeah. I am also not a fan of anyone taking advantage of someone um, with techniques that are going to cause great bodily harm. Like a sense of proportionality is what you're saying. Is, exactly. Is, is important, yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, a deep sense of you have responsibility, yeah. and it boils down to that. You have responsibility to mankind. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's 
Absolutely true. Um, you, you mentioned earlier about dealing with the state as well. Like, so when you were up at the, at what level do you start dealing with political um, pressures? I, I mean, at what point in, in your career as an officer did you have to, I suppose, um, be a, a witness in, in a legislative hearing and to affect policy? Like, where would that occur along the chain of command? Is that mostly at the chief's level, or would that, would that occur down at the commander level? A lot of the political things are at a different level originally, but it's kind of interesting. I'm thinking through that question while I'm talking here. Yeah, no, we got yeah, we have a lot of time, so. The department, <laughs> it's interesting, and you probably see this in the military because you're going to maybe laugh. You start seeing political things and how things happen from deputy sheriff level on. Okay. And I'll give you an example. We've talked about the riots of the 60s. Back then, there was, there was no less than lethal. I'll just go back to the force stuff. Somewhere along the line, it was determined that less than lethal had to be introduced into our tool belt Dude. of go-to things, and yeah. it was called less than lethal then, which means that uh, you have to have something in your tool belt other than a gun, a shotgun, a backup gun, um, a, you know, a cold cock and somebody. There have to be other methods of takedown by way of a new baton, uh, something that you have that you can go to in your radio car to use to take somebody down. And I go to that era because there was a drug that was um, being introduced out into the streets that caused people to go absolutely stark raving crazy. And the, there was a very difficult time on the department with that because we weren't sure exactly how we were supposed to deal with these these crazies that were so souped up on this stuff, they were very, very difficult to subdue. And far too many were falling into a bad category on the Sheriff's Department in how we dealt with it. So there were decisions back then on how to, how to use something less than lethal in these takedowns, in how you how you dealt with somebody like this, the go-to people. Um, so prior to that was just gun and baton, and it was just lot. do what you have to do. Handcuffing techniques, okay. baton, but, straight stick. We didn't have them at knocks. And so I take you all the way back to even yeah. when I was a deputy sheriff and what we were trained, and then very shortly thereafter, what came along because of the pressures of society where, wait a minute, you got to deal with this differently. And of course, we recognized that and, and started looking into other methods of uh, takedowns, um, uh, talk downs. I'm hesitating yeah. here because then, then it went from, well, then the baton isn't working. It's a straight stick, and it's used in, in, incorrectly. What's a straight stick? A straight what? stick as opposed to a monadnock. They're both batons. Mm -hmm. But the sheriff's department originally, I was trained on a straight stick, which is just a long stick that you oh, use okay. uh, in your uh, come-along techniques, in your takedown techniques, in your use of force. Well, there, along comes this tool called a monadnock, which is the baton of today that has a handle on it. And the reason that that was... Uh, like we, a perpendicular correct. portion of it. Okay, I've like seen that Like an L-shaped. Got it, okay. And the reason that uh, the Sheriff's Department decided to go to that particular baton and drop the straight stick was because you had more control over it and it didn't get taken away from you, much like a straight stick Okay. Was. Yeah, no, I could see that because a straight stick could just be pulled directly out of your hand, whereas with the extra handle there, it's mm -hmm. a little bit more difficult. Okay. So if we're going yeah. to incrementally build along the way, there has been a change of how the Sheriff's Department, and I can only speak to the Sheriff's Department, done business in the world of the use of force for a long time. Yeah. And so to deal with it politically... We learned to deal with it politically even back then because there were people that we worked around that were getting in trouble for what they were doing. And there were 
new training mechanisms that were put into place to maybe prevent that from ever happening again. So our world of learn will never end. Our world of learn oftentimes falls on everyone's back by something unfortunate that happens. Mm -hmm. But then our world of learn moves us into a new category of train, learn, get better. How can we move forward? Now, how much training is there um, in terms of hand-to-hand -hand combat once you are a, a deputy? I know it may it's probably changed a bit since you were on the force, but I heard, again, this I might be completely wrong on this, but I heard it's like a, a couple hours a year. I mean, actual hand-to-hand -hand wrestling, choking, all that type of training. It's not that much. I really can't answer to it. Okay. I, I can tell you that there were um, times where the department took a very large chunk of time to train deputy sheriffs on in a training program where a majority of it was uh, training on the Monadnock, training on takedowns, training on all of these other types of uh, approach techniques, and then, of course, hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff. Okay, okay. Um, there is a state requirement of how much time you have to spend giving that training every year. Sometimes that training is given at the station level, and sometimes it is given department-wide. It just depends on uh, the focus. Mm -hmm. And so I can't speak to now. Okay. I yeah. just can't. I, I was curious about it because with the, um, obviously I'm sure you've seen the news with the guy got his, uh, Floyd and he had his the cop had his knee on his neck and he ended up dying um, and it's not just that incident but there's there's some others where people are saying like um, why not have some more like jujitsu type training which is a fantastic thing which I started doing last year I had to stop because of the just different reasons but it was really valuable I mean just how you can manipulate arms how you can do a good choke hold and not hurt somebody and um, I could just tell if somebody doesn't have that type of training how it could be really difficult I, I couldn't imagine if you didn't have that training and then you're an officer and all you got your taser you got your gun you got your baton and you haven't really know you don't really know how to take somebody down and subdue them how it could be you could get yourself in a bad situation but there are was, hours of takedown techniques yeah. that the recruits at the sheriff's academy have to go through hours of okay. uh, use of force training uh, hours of talk down training, yeah. and so the um, talk down training meaning uh, de escalation, okay. de escalation, defusing a circumstance. You know, there's all of that training that goes on, and it is uh, multifaceted, and much of it is related to come along techniques and all of those things that you are What's speaking to. What's a come along to. technique? Well, a come along technique would be something that you would have to apply to somebody to get them to come your way. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. can you come yeah. over come here? Come with me. Can you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. okay. And so it's uh, everything from wrist pressure, hand pressure, elbow pressure, neck pressure. Yeah. Uh, all of those techniques are taught. I just have been away from it too long right. now, oh, I and I need to yeah. qualify. I will hearken you to one thing, and then I would prefer to not get into the politics of this. If there is one thing that all of us... I think to the man can agree upon is the tragedy, tragedy of George Floyd's death. Oh, yeah. Everybody agrees on that for sure. Yeah. Uh, what, what, did heart you, what, sick. what did you think about it? I mean, heart sick. Yeah. I'm for heart many reasons, I'm sure. Yeah. Sick. And I want to make that clear. Oh, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I think it's everybody. It's still a sad day. Yeah, I think everybody everybody agrees with that. That was that was pretty pretty tragic. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if we wanted to get into some of the other stuff as well, but you know, um, I, yeah, I do think that it is unfair when you have that that one incident, and even then, we don't even know what the motivations of that officer were. Mm -hmm. We don't know if it was racial, but it became a racial incident, which I'm sure is frustrating for a lot of 
officers as well. I mean, did you find that you think something, sometimes something in the media would happen and you're like, wait a minute, that's not what happened. And did you feel like it was, you were treated unfairly by the public at any time or did you generally feel like things were pretty good? There are times when, uh, especially working SWAT, where the circumstances that you are dished are so overwhelming. And to try and um, weave your way through start to finish, you know, it's already started when you get there. And yeah. now you got to finish it. And what is that going to take? And how many people are behind you watching what's going on becomes irrelevant, but yet you have to answer to their questions. And that can be uh, um, amazingly important to make sure that you can get where you are to the finish line for the guys that are in there doing the job but also make sure that somehow the people that are behind you asking all the questions are put into some sort of a comfort zone that assures them that the job is being done absolutely the best we can with the most powerful, positive, right decisions being made. Outcome might not be exactly what you want, but you better know all along the way that we are doing the best we can based on the circumstances we've been given. Hey, you almost have to be a cop and a politician at the same time. Humor. It's a, it's a weird position to be in. Sometimes humor. You'd be surprised. The sense of because humor, Because huh? <laughs> the... Uh, the tenseness yeah. and the severity of the circumstances, if you can bust it up at some point in time with humor, yeah. it, changes, uh, it changes everybody's chemicals in their brain. That's it true. really does. It, yeah, that's a good point. It changes their chemicals. And so I always tried to find a way to insert some levity that was not cutting or... Uh, ill-appropriately placed, but it was certainly worth it at the time because it gave everybody a chance to pause and let their shoulders down for a second and then get back to work. Yeah. How, yeah. how long were you on SWAT? Five years. Five, and what, what time, what years was that? Ooh, uh, 95, 96. Okay, so mid-90s. Yeah, mid-90s okay. to early 2000s. Okay, so that was... Um, that was kind of when, was that a point when uh, police were becoming a little more, I guess, trained and aware? I feel like the, the, the riots in L.A. happened in 92. Uh -huh. Yes. And then we had, of course, probably a big reaction and more training, more equipment, more resources. Did, did you notice a difference in the mid-90s where things, did things improve? Like. What Hell. was funny about the mid-90s was, uh, in answer to your question, yes. There were certain tools of the trade that were being introduced to us that we had never, ever been able to get our hands on before. And it was by way of a program that was established with the Sheriff's Department where we got leftover stuff from the military. I've heard about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge... Uh, boon for us to be able to creatively pick up something that the military no longer needed or wanted and reincorporate it into our world, especially in SWAT at the time, to make our job a little more safer and um, gave us better options mm -hmm. to get things done. Okay. And that was by way of military vehicle. And I know a lot of people take a look at that now out there in the world of, oh, my God, they've got all of this stuff. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about. People say, well, if they didn't have all that great equipment, then we wouldn't have to have as much incidents or something. But I'm like, well, I don't know if that's really how the causation should work. But well, I mean, what was your... 
What we found is that yeah. that great equipment gave us the flexibility to be able to get into situations quicker and faster because it gave us protection. Yeah. And it gave us options on how we would dynamically insert ourselves. And it gave us options on how to uh, stop something in its tracks, vehicle, whatever, um, in a more effective way and quicker. And then also it gave us a place to store stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was more than just a car. Okay, we're back on. Yeah. So those vehicles may appear yeah. to be imposing. Yeah. But that's what we got. And a lot of it we got for free or for a dollar or for whatever. Yeah. Uh, so we were incredibly appreciative of having something that was going to give us a, a better resource to use as a tool. Now, the funny part about that, they give you the stuff, but they don't fix it before they give it to you. And oh, there well, are that's many nice. <laughs> so they can just dump it on you. So you're like the goodwill. There are many We're times where I'd be rolling to, some call, rolling to some call out someplace and yeah. I pass some of my dudes on the side of the freeway with their AAA card out, uh, hoping to have somebody <laughs> help them with a, an overflowing radiator, overheated engine. So they have some military equipment, well, uh, former military equipment, and they're, and they're having to call a tow truck. Well, that's, that instills confidence in the public. Special. Yeah, yeah. Well, Special. God, that is funny. And, what, and so when did you retire? What, what year? I retired in 2005. So I spent 30 years on the job. Okay. And it was 55 years old. And if there's something that I think is incredibly important in the whole topic of working is learning how not to work. Oh, I bet. So, what, what, so how do you not work? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Does anybody think about not working? You always talk about, oh, if I won, if I won the lottery, blah, 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 blah. And how fun is that? You know, I would never go back to work. But, but what, what I learned <laughs> is people would say to me, oh, my God, Kathy, you're retiring 30 years. Don't you want to work longer? And I'd look at them and I'd say, it took me 30 years to learn how to work. My intentions now are to take 30 years to learn how to be retired. And it is a phase of life that comes. So embrace it, take it, and move on. But in order to do that well, you have to snap balance again. Yeah. And what we found as a husband and wife is that, yeah, you're working, but also you need to continue to learn along the way how to play together and um, how to enjoy each other and how to remain a couple without work. Because if I came home every day and barked orders, like sometimes I had to do at work, Things wouldn't go so well around the house. Yeah, two different yeah. worlds. Two different worlds, and you can't make one topple on top of the other. And it worked both ways. So we learned having our boys, finding ways to celebrate life separately from the job, sharing with each other, enjoying vacations, and always taking a vacation. But lastly, planning for retirement financially and healthy and uh, with a good mental attitude. You learn to move through your retirement by planning things that you want to do before you retire, not when you retire. You'll get bored if you don't. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Well, it sounds like you're, you're uh, an expert on retirement as well, so maybe we can come back and talk about that one of these times. <laughs> oh, a whole lot of ho-hum, golly gee willikers, what am I gonna do today? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're doing you're doing well. I might add, this is a, a this has been great. Well, I do appreciate you coming on. I mean, this is fantastic. Um, I hope people learned a lot about you and about the career. I know I know I did. So um, so thank you so much. And um, yeah, Kathy Taylor, I really appreciate you coming on to the Greg Crino Show. Well, you're welcome, Greg Crino. Thank you for having <laughs> me. All right. We'll see you next time. Thank you. That's a deal. 